Good evening. Good to see you guys. Glad you could join us tonight as we worship the mighty and powerful name of Yahweh, our God. Amen? <clears throat> so, let's not hesitate and let's just get going. Sound good to you? Not like our God, amen. A weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper when the 
darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. And my God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. So I'm gonna see a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Yes, I'm going to see a victory. Yes, I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Take what the enemy meant for evil, you turn it for good. Yes, you turn it for good. Yes, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. Yes, you turn it for good. We surrender. Yes, you take what the enemy meant. You turn it for good, you turn it around, yeah. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. Yes, you turn it for good. So I'm going to see a victory. Yes, I'm going to see a victory for the I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take, yeah. you take the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. Yes, you turn it for good. You turn it around. You take the enemy meant for. Say the weapon. A weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Yes, he does. And my God will never fail, we believe. Oh, yes, my God will never fail. No, we won't, no. We say, my God will never fail. 
Amen. You believe that? You could stand against our God. There's none. Amen.
give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you, Lord. Guys, lift that up, sing. It's all the shout our hearts. Sing great of you. All the earth shout it. We sing all the earth. We shout your praise. We shout your praise.
sing, Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. That's your name. The mountains shake and crumble. And that's your name. The oceans roar and tumble. And that's your name. Angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry out. We sing, Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name. Father, we are gather 
for that very purpose, God, to just declare that you're a king, that you're worthy of all of our praise, that, God, you are truth, and that, God, you've left us, God, instructions on how to, how to live, and, Lord, the truth that we're to hold as our standard, Lord, and we ask that you would, God, just to unveil those things to us, Lord, just, Lord, open our ears and our eyes, our hearts, God, just to hear your voice, and, Lord, may we learn the lessons, God, that uh, you would have us learn tonight. Lord, may your spirit, God, just fall upon us. And, Lord, I pray that you, God, would, Lord, align our hearts with your heart. God, may the things you call good, we call good. The things you call evil, would we agree, God, they're evil. Lord, would you continue, God, to God, make yourself known to us. Father, we ask that you would be with our community, Lord, this whole valley, God, in desperate need of your help. Lord, so much hurting lives and, Lord, so much, uh, so much despair, God, and we, we know it's because, God, you're, you're the only one that can bring hope. And so, Lord, we ask that you would do that, Lord, those that are addicted to drugs and, Lord, just lost in, in their own situations or circumstances god that you would lord bring bring an awakening our own families our friends our neighbors god just uh, god move mightily and god we ask that you would be with our nation god and we know that god that, that means that you would have to awaken us and lord we ask you would do that that you would awaken us as a nation that god there would be a, a real true transformation god that would take place throughout our nation bring a revival in our land father we pray Lord, bless our time now we thank you and we love you and we commit all of it to you we ask it lord i i also heard there was a there was a head-on collision on river road and i'd be with whoever is in that accident i pray you'd watch over them bless them lord keep them safe whatever whatever's going on whatever medical needs they have would you just meet that need and Lord, we ask that you go before that situation. We just lift it up in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. How are you guys? I, there you are. Okay. Would you say hi to somebody next to you? And you can be seated. Awesome. Well, we um, had heard uh, of, of a, the, the accident that took place. So uh, I, we had several phone calls saying, hey, we can't make it to church because the, the road's closed. Is, is the road still closed? Does anybody know? River Road coming in? Open? What's that? The bridge is closed? I didn't hear that. Is six thirty was still closed? Okay. All right. I was. I was just. I just had heard it that that had happened. Um, we've been telling you guys we're going to do some construction. I don't know, it, it, but we try to finish it up as much as possible. But um, it, we have two brand new walls going down the side here. In case you didn't notice, um, the the top. You can still see the framing on the top. We'll hopefully finish that up by by Sunday, and then we'll. We're just in need of more room, and so uh, we're going to have a prayer room kind of on that far corner that'll be open all the time for groups that gather to pray and to have um, just a, a designated area during services. There'll be a group praying during every service, and so that's kind of, man, to me, that's, that's a cool thing. It's, I think it's uh, something that's, that's necessary, and then we're going to have a new believer room on that far end, so... When people make commitments to Christ, we have somewhere to sit with them and counsel with them and pray with them and encourage them. So um, th those, all, all that's happening. Um, we had a crew come in, a couple of us that used to frame and drywall for a living, meaning me, and a group of others had the chance. I, I, I just love 
doing it. So it was like, man, I get a couple days to just go out there and put on my bags. And so we, we, got, we got to frame and get the drywall up. And f tomorrow we'll hopefully get this side done before we tape and texture and paint and all that stuff. So um, that's, uh, th then, then all the work begins on the inside. We just wanted to cover the mess. And so we got, we got a bunch of U-turn guys showing up Monday. They're going to do a bunch of demo and tear out a bunch of stuff for us, and then and then we're going to um, get the um, everything built out in, in those areas. So that, that's that's going on the next couple of weeks. Hopefully, the next hopefully in the next three four weeks we'd have it wrapped up, and so that'll be awesome. Second Chronicles. If you have your Bible with you, would you open up Second Chronicles? Left off in chapter 13. Um, we finished the life of Rehoboam, who was Solomon's son, David's grandson. We now move into the life of Abijah. And remember, Chronicles is only giving us the, the history of the nation of Israel, but particularly the two tribes of Judah, Benjamin, or not the two tribes, what am I saying? The, the, the two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, right? So there, there, there's two tribes that, that are of the southern kingdom, the other ten tribes, the northern kingdom, and first and second kings covers both tribes, or both nations, the, the split, but here in Second Chronicles, we're only focusing in on the kings of Judah, who actually lasted longer because they had the temple, they were worshiping the Lord, they, they, they had a lot, of, a lot more good kings than the northern kingdom did. And, and so um, we, we were going to track them through their history. And what's exciting in, in this whole chapter, guys, is, is that you, you, you get to see that God is moving even, even in, in times when you don't think that he is. God is working behind the scenes, even in circumstances where you kind of sit back and go, and how can God use this? Or, you know, why would God use this? Or, you know, does it even seem right that God would use this? You, you see, God never gives up on us. That's the cool thing. And, and when you look at lives like this, where we look at Abijah, and, and it's, it, he's an interesting character in the Bible in that, he says all the right things, but what you find out is that he really wasn't doing all the right things. And God was preserving the lineage of David, even through a man who really um, wasn't living up to his potential or what God had called him to do. And so I, I, I think that, that that applies to us, in, you know, in our day. You know, God will do things. You kind of go like, that don't make sense. God's got a plan in the future. <laughs> God's reserving something. God's preserving something. God is doing something that you and I can't grasp yet, but God's going to show it down the road, right? And and I think that this is what, this jump right in. Look, look, at, look at chapter 13, 2 Chronicles. In the 18th year of King Jeroboam, Abijah became, a king over, became king over Judah. He reigned for three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Micaiah, the daughter of Ural of Gibeah. And there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam. Now, we don't know what that war was about. We don't know why the war was taking place. All, all we're told is that this new king comes into power and he was the great grandson of David, and him and Jeroboam were at war with one another. It seems that Jeroboam was looking for opportunity to, to expand his kingdom, to kind of overthrow and unite the nation, but with him as the king of the nation of, of Israel. And so when Abijah comes into power, he's only, he was only there for three years, so it was early in his, in his reign that Jeroboam decides he's going he's to attack Israel or Judah and Benjamin, the, where, where the temple was. Now, Abijah 
when you read these verses, you're going to kind of go, man, Abijah looks like a good guy. Some of the things he's saying as you look at 2 Chronicles chapter 13, you're, you're going to go, man, this guy knows God. He knows what he's talking about. He knows truth. So before we get into that, I, I want you to have a little background about Abijah. So you're, we're going to turn now to 1 Kings chapter 15. It's only eight verses on his life in 1 Kings. It's 1 Kings chapter 15. And it gives us more of an overview of his life. Kind of the same beginning of 2 Chronicles in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nabat. Abijah became king over Judah. Here it is. He reigned three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Maacah, Maaka, the granddaughter of Absalom. And here it is. And he walked in all the sins of his father which he had done before him. His heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem by setting up his son after him and by establishing Jerusalem because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him in all the days of his life except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. And there was war between Jeroboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life. That's pretty much, you know, the scope of his life. He, he, he wasn't loyal to the Lord. He, he really didn't give his heart over to the Lord. He wasn't, he wasn't totally surrendered, committed to the Lord. But one thing you're going to find out is that he knew about the Lord. He, he, he knew what was right in God's eyes, he just wasn't willing to do what was right. He wasn't really to commit himself over to the Lord. And how many people in our day find themselves in that same position? I grew up in the church. I, I, I know what God says. I, I know what right is. But I just really don't want to commit completely to the Lord. I, I really don't want my heart to be loyal to the Lord to that extent. And I think you, 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 look, you look at this young man here, and he had, he had um, a great-grandpa who was loyal to the Lord. He had a, a, a great-grandpa who was, who was radically loyal to the Lord. And because of his great-grandpa's heritage, because of the promises that God had given to David... Abijah's life is spared. That, that, that's an incredible thought to, to think that here, here it is generations down the road and, and David's faithfulness was having an impact upon his great-great-grandson. That, that his faithfulness was, was, was actually having an effect upon not only his great-grandson, but you're going to see here as we get into chapter 14, his great-great-great-grandson. And to think that, that your life and my life can have that kind of an impact, not just in our generation or our children, but our, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. If we would just have a loyal heart, just a, a radical commitment to the things that God declares. That everything can change, man, no matter what your upbringing was, no matter what your dad did or your grandpa did, that, that you, you, you can change the course of your sons and grandsons and great, great. And, and, I, and, I, and I love this passage because I, I think it, it kind of makes us be confronted with that. Watch, watch what happens here. Verse 3. Abijah set the battle in order with an army of valiant warriors, 400,000 choice men. Jeroboam also drew up a battle formation against him with 800,000 choice men, mighty men of valor. The battle line's drawn. On one side, an army, 400,000 strong. On the other side, an army, 800,000 strong. And when you battled in that day, guys, it wasn't like, you know, pushing a button or, 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 or pulling a trigger. It was face-to-face it was, it was -face combat. It was, it was 
mano y mano. It was sword against sword. It was, you, this, this was, you know, in your grill war. And, and here, here, here's the deal. When you go up and you've got an army of 400,000 and you kind of look at the army with 800,000, it's kind of like, uh-oh, <laughs> this doesn't look good. That, that, that's, that's a massive, massive disadvantage. Two to one. When it comes to a battle of that magnitude, it, it is an impossible hill to overcome. And Abijah, somewhere inside him, we, we know he wasn't loyal to the Lord. We, we, we know that, that he, he had a, a lot of idolatry from his, his dad that he had learned, but somewhere inside of him, he knew what was right was. No, no, notice, look, look, at, look at verse 4. Abijah stood on Mount Zimmerim, which is in the mountain of Ephraim. And he said, hear me, Jeroboam, and all of Israel. Should you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the dominion over Israel to David forever, to him and to his sons by a covenant of salt? Should you not know that, that God's the one who established David's lineage, promised him that he would have a son that would sit on the throne? Don't you, don't you know what God said, Jeroboam? That's, that's really what he's saying. Don't, don't you know that God establishes and God made a covenant and then it was a covenant with salt. So salt was a binding covenant. And then he turns around and he says, Yet Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, rose up and rebelled against his Lord. Then worthless men rose, gathered to him, strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, when Rehoboam was young and inexperienced and could not withstand them. Now, you know, he, he's recalling how Jeroboam came into power. He's kind of going through Jeroboam's history. He's saying, look, you know, th this is how it happened. You rebelled against David in David's house. When Solomon died and his son came in, in, into power, Rehoboam, you led a coup to try to overthrow them and you became a king over these ten kingdoms. He goes, then all of, that you've done was against the Lord. And it's against God's design, God's plan. And th this, this is what's interesting. He says, and then you gathered a bunch of worthless rogues <laughs> to fight against what God has established. He, he's, he, he's just recalling how we got into the position he would got into. Look at the next verse. Look, look at verse 8. And now you think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord, which is in the hand of the son of David, and you are a great multitude, and with you are the gold calves which Jeroboam made for you as gods. Now remember, Jeroboam had established these idols, golden calves. <laughs> and he said, guys, you don't have to go to Jerusalem to worship any longer. You can worship right here. Right? And he established a place of worship that was outside of God's design. God's plan for them as a nation to worship the Lord. Now, they must have taken these golden calves with them to the battlefield, thinking that somehow this was their gods that was going to bring victory to them. And so... Abijah's just kind of going, look, you, you, got, you guys are fighting against God right now. You, you need to understand what you're doing. You, you, you need to come to terms that you can't win against God. And if you would listen to Abijah without knowing what's going on in, in uh, First Kings account, you would think, man, this, guy, this guy's got it together. Everything he's saying sounds true. It, it was half true. See, Royal Boehm was inexperienced, but Royal Boehm and his pride didn't take the counsel of his counselors. And so he was doing exactly as Abijah is 
declaring here, but there, there was another, there was a little kind of part left out, right? But, but no, notice, notice what he says next. Look, look, look at the next passage. Have you not cast out the priests of the Lord and the sons of Aaron and the Levites and made for yourself priests like the people of other lands? So that whoever comes to consecrate himself with a young bull and seven rams may be a priest of things that are not God's? Now, the Levites and the priests were to do the sacrifices. They were to be the representatives for God. That was, that was God's design. Again, Rehoboam says, hey, you don't have to be a priest or a Levite to do this. You, you, we'll, we'll just, whoever brings a bull and whoever brings the, the right sacrifices, seven rams, you know, we'll make you a priest. And so he had all of these priests that really weren't called into the ministry doing what only the Levites and the priests were to do. Again, undermining what God had declared. You see, when you start to set up your own golden calves and start to set up your own priests, you're coming to God, you're saying, God, I'm going to worship you, but I'm going to worship you on my terms. I I'm going to worship you. We, we still want you to be our God. We're just going to have other representations of who you are. And the moment that you do that, what you're declaring is, God, I know better than you know. I'm kind of making up my own God rather than surrendering myself over to God. And as he recalls these things, he says, but for us. Now he goes, look, that's what you guys are doing. Let me tell you what we're doing. And he says there in verse 10, but as for us, the Lord is our God. We have not forsaken him. The priests who minister to the Lord are the sons of Aaron. And the Levites attend to their duties. They burn to the Lord every morning. And every evening burnt sacrifices and sweet incense. They also set the showbread in order and the pure gold table and the lampstands of gold with its lamps to burn every evening. For we keep the commandments of the Lord our God. But you have forsaken him. No, no, no. You know, Abijah, you know, look, we're doing the right things. You guys have totally abandoned the right things. And he's making this contrast between the two. Now, as we're going through the story, guys, understand something. God isn't honoring Abijah because, because Abijah had a, had a divided heart. What he's honoring it was David's loyalty and David's commitment. But there was some truth to what he's declaring. They, 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 were, they were a little closer to what God had prescribed than the other side, right? And, and that, that's what he's declaring to them. Look, look we're, we're doing a lot better than you guys. Now, it gets good. Look at verse 12. Now look, God himself is with us as our head and his priests with sounding trumpets to sound the alarm against the old children of Israel. Do not fight against the Lord God of, our, of your fathers for you shall not prosper. Now again, again, everything he's saying is like, man, that's right on. This guy understands spiritual things. He gets what, what you know, should be happening. But, Jeroboam, there's that, there's that contrast again. But Jeroboam caused an ambush to go around behind them. So they were in front of Judah and the ambush was behind. And when Judah looked around, so they're surprised. The battle line was at both front and rear. And here's the key. They cried out to the Lord. The priest sounded the trumpet. The men of Judah gave a shout. The men of Judah shouted, it happened that God struck Jeroboam and all of Israel before Abijah and Judah. Now, as Abijah was giving his rebuke, he was, you know, trying to get their attention. Let's not do this. You know, we shouldn't be warring against one another. You know, you guys have blown it, but, you know, let's, let's not go there. During that whole speech, Jeroboam had sent the troops around the other side, and they had them sandwiched in, the front and the back. And when Abijah kind of 
comes to, he kind of turns around, and there there was an army on one side. And remember, there was an army that was twice as big as his. Interesting that there would have been 400,000 on one side, 400,000 on the other side. And, you know, how, how, how do you fight that battle? And all, all it tells us is that they cried out to the Lord. Guys, I, 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 I love that about this passage. Is that we know that this wasn't a man with a loyal heart, but we, we do know this, man. He knew that without God, he wasn't going to ever make it. He understood something. God, unless you help us, we're done. As those are the prayers that God hears. The prayers when, when we come and say, God, we, we, we've, we've blown it up until this point. Whatever we've done in the past, God, we, we acknowledge that unless you help us, there's no help. Unless you help us, there's no answer to our dilemma. And they cried out to the Lord, and it says, and the Lord defeated the enemy. And that, 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 that should be a great encouragement to you. It is to me. Because I, 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 you see, here, here's, let me give you a little bit of my background. Grew up knowing truth. Grew, grew up saved when I was 12, 13 years old, filled with the Holy Spirit. God radically touched my life. And after a year or two, man, I went, I went right back into my sin. And for about 10 years, man, walked in rebellion to God. I, 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 I was one of the devil's agents. I, I, was, I was pretty pretty up there too, <laughs> pretty faithful. Doing his bidding, you know, just living for self, drinking, partying, drugging, you know, just living for the, the party, for the flesh, for every moment that, you know, for, for, for the selfish desires of my own heart. And, and, and the cool thing is, is I, I didn't have a loyal heart, even though I knew what right was. But the moment I cried out to the Lord, man, he was, he was there with open arms. He, he was there saying, you know what? I've been waiting for you. <laughs> Welcome home. And you may find yourself in that same place where, where you know you, you know what right is, and you've kind of you've kind of at one point in your life said, God, I I want your way and your will. But somewhere along the way, you you had a disloyal heart. You kind of you kind of played the fence, kind of a little a little of party, a little bit of fun. I, I know what right is, but I really don't want to obey it. But and then you you find yourself kind of up against the curb. You kind of realize, man, I, I need God. I need God's help. And the moment you cry out to the Lord, he's right there to help you. He's, he's right there to, to intervene in your circumstance, in your situation, and there's nothing too hard for the Lord. There's nothing that he cannot rescue you from. And, and, and Abijah learns this. I mean, you know, I, I, what, what, what a lesson to learn. You, you're, in, you're in the middle of this battle. And you realize there's no way to win this battle unless, unless God helps us unless God intervenes. God shows up, defeats the enemy. Look, 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 look at the next verse. And the children of Israel fled before Judah, and God delivered them into their hand, and Abijah and his people struck them with a great slaughter. So 500,000 choice men of Israel fell slain. Guys, 500 out of 800,000 died. This, this was the greatest loss of life in Israel's history. And it was them fighting against one another. And it was at odds that, that didn't make sense. Because God is the one who's able to bring victory. And, and what, what, what a tragedy. You know, 500,000 men in this one battle die. Because there was, there was a Rebellion against God, against God's what God declared to be right, and, and, and the warnings were there, and they weren't heeded. And then check this out. Look at the next passage. And, a, and verse 18, thus the children of Israel were subdued at that time, and the children of Judah prevailed. Here it is, because they relied on the Lord God of their fathers. We, we, we know why the victory came, because they relied on the Lord God. 
They, they, they knew that, God, you're, you're the only one who can deliver us. You're the only one who can bring victory for us. And because they relied on the Lord, the Lord came through. And, and check this out. Abijah pursued Jeroboam and took cities from him, Bethel with its villages and Jeshaniah with its villages and Ephraim with its villages. So Jeroboam did not recover strength again in the days of Abijah and the Lord struck him and he died. And Abijah grew mighty, married 14 wives, begot 22 sons and 16 daughters. Can't even imagine what the braces would have cost. Just <laughs> why would you even don't go there? Let's again, what, what did Solomon do? Seven hundred wives, three hundred concubines, you know, Rehoboam had had, you know, a, another list of wives and you know, all of these children. And, and, and you, you know, you, when, when you look at Solomon, you kind of like, oh, well, I, you know, I really, I'm not doing too bad. I mean, compared to Solomon, I only have 14 wives. Not too bad. <laughs> 714, and I, I'm, I'm improving. That's, that's why we can never compare ourselves against ourselves. <laughs> we we got to compare ourselves with what the Lord says, not with what, what man does, because like you, you can always find someone that you're better than, right? Like you start looking around like, well, I got to find someone, you know, but look for the next mass murderer. I'm better than him. <laughs> you know, you just, you, 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 it, we can all find someone worse than us. But, but here, here, here's, here's Abijah, you know, he had 14 wives, a host of children. And then it ends, and the rest of the acts of Abijah, his ways... And his sayings are written in the annals of the, of the prophet Edu. Idu. It was the guy that did all the marriages. I do. No, it was. <laughs> With that many wives, get me someone that's going to do a lot of marriages. Okay. <laughs> Verse 14, chapter 14. Here. here. So Abijah rested with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. Then Asa, his son, reigned in his place. In his days, the land was quiet for ten years. Now Asa, 41-year reign, one of the good kings. For 41 years, he's, he's going to reign um, for for. I think the northern kingdom has, you know, seven, eight, nine different kings while he's in power. I think he comes all the way from this point where, where we find yourself now till Elijah's ministry. I mean, that, that he, he, he's, he's going to have a, a pretty good run. Could you imagine if we had a godly leader for 41 years, what, what would happen? Boy, we need to be praying for that, don't we? Lord, bring in some godly leadership for the next 41 years. That would be, that would be amazing. Here, here it is for 41 years. And it tells us in verse 2, And Asa did what was good and what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God. You see, he defined what good and what right was according to what God declared what good and right was. It was in the eyes of the Lord. But the Bible says there's going to be a generation, there's going to be people who do what's right in their own eyes. That there's going to be a generation that's, that calls good evil and evil good. But when, when you have a generation that, that's saying, we're, we're going to do what's right in the eyes of God, because God's the one who establishes what right is. God is what good is. And so we're going to line ourselves up with what God declares, because if we, do, if we line ourselves with what God declares, then we are right, and we are, you know, living good. And that was Esau. He was a man who said, I, I want to do what's right in God's eyes. 
I don't care what man says. I don't, I don't care what the world tells me. I don't care what culture says. I, I want to do what's good in God's eyes. I want to do what's right in God's measure of things. Because God's worthy of declaring what right and good is. And when you and I line ourselves up with what God declares right and good is, then, 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 then we're doing what's right and good, right? That's the only time that we're doing what's right and good. And, and what's, what's, what's amazing is we, we got a little bit of, of, of what had happened. For 10 years, it says there was rest in the land. For 10 years, no war. I don't think he squandered the 10 years. He didn't like, well, nothing's going on. This is all, you know, Dan. I think those 10 years he was preparing. He was preparing because he knows that at some point there's going to be turmoil. There is going to be the enemy that's going to try to attack. And for 10 years, he, he, he is establishing the nation, I think, militarily, but I also think spiritually. I think, I think we're going to find out that his dad had an army of 400,000. He has an army of 580,000. That means he was, he was militarily doing some things during those 10 years of peace. But it also tells us that, that in, in verse 3, watch this, he removed the altars of the foreign gods and the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and he cut down the wooden images. A lot of that his great-grandpa had put in Solomon. As he's began to accumulate wives from different regions and they brought their gods with them. And, and now he's tearing down these sacred pillars and he's tearing down these wooden images. And what, what, what's amazing is that he, he didn't just sit around while there was peace. He, he was saying, man, we need to get right. We need, to, we need to do what's right in God's eyes. And so he begins this journey. If you read the, the, the account in First Kings of Abijah, he says he got rid of the perverted people. And, and many, many of, the, uh, of the commentators and a lot of, lot of the, the things, that, the, the, those that were sexually deviant, he, he said he, he, he removed that from the land. He was cleansing the place. He was saying, no, no more you know, doing what's right in your own eyes. We're going to line ourselves up with what God says is right. And so he, he took it to, to a whole other level. Look, look, look what he says in, in verse 5. He also removed the high places and the incense altars and from all the cities of Judah, and the kingdom was quiet under him. That's the second time it's mentioned. They had rest. The, the place is quiet. There, 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 was, there was peace in the land. When, when, when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. When, when, when there's godliness in, in, in leadership, man, there, there, there's, there's peace and there's, there's quietness so that you can live a life and pursue the things that God created us to pursue. It's when we start to immorally break down that, that all the turmoil begins to overtake. And, and guys, I, I'm concerned where we're at as a nation. I'll be, I'll be just very honest with you. I'm concerned because of morally where we've gone, what, what, what the consequences of that are going to be. What, what, what are the ramifications that, that are coming down the pipe because we've abandoned God, because we've, we've decided that, that life isn't, isn't something that's to be cherished. Thank, thank God for our Supreme Court justice. Be praying for those guys right now. Praying for, for that, that they, they don't buckle under all of the, the, the pressure that they're being put under and the threats that they're being put under, that they don't just say, you know what, it's not worth it and just, just give in on, on the issue. But it looks like they're standing for life for the first time. Guys, I, I, I'm convinced that what we see happening in our nation is because, because of our, our own doing. We've forsaken God. And the result is, is that there, there's, there's a lot of turmoil. We have 63 million babies since Roe vs. Wade that have been aborted. That's a lot of life. A lot of life. And here... 
Esau is tearing down all of these places of worship, all these strongholds that had been in the nation, and he's cleaning house. And it says, because the Lord gave them rest. Because the Lord, it was quiet. Well, look, look, look at, I think, the second part of that passage there. Uh, verse 6, he built fortified cities in Judah. The land had rest. He had no war in those years because the Lord had given him rest. Now, Esau was seeking the Lord. And I, I think I, I actually skipped verse 4, which is kind of the, 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 the whole context of this. Look, look at verse 4. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to observe the law and the commandments. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord as a king. He just said, look, guys, we veered. We, you know, we, we, we've gone off track. These, all of these sacred pillars, we're, we're tearing this down. All these places of sacrifice that God hasn't prescribed, we're removing these things now. And he says, seek the Lord, and not just seek the Lord. He says, do what the law and the commandments declare you to do. Observe them. Do them. Start, start, start to obey what God declares to be right. Man, that, 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 man, I can only imagine what it would be like in our culture right now for, for a leader to stand up and... and declare these kinds of things in his nation. Could you, I mean, it, it would be, it, it would shake our world. And, and here Esau, man, he's, he's doing what, what God had told him to do. And it, over and over you see, you know, it was quiet in the land. God brought, God brought rest in the land. It was, it, it was a, a time where there was, there was peace in the land. There was, there was no, no battles for 10 years. Now, Verse 7, therefore, he said to Judah, let us build these cities, make walls around them, towers, gates, bars, while the land is yet before us, because we have sought the Lord our God, we have sought him, and he has given us rest on every side. So they built and they prospered. Isn't that a cool thing? He, he just was an idol during that time of rest. He was like, man, we're going to build our cities. We're going to build our walls. We're going to put gates in. We're going to, you know, we're going to prepare for whatever's going to come our way, but we're, we're, you know, we're, we're not going to be idle here. We're going to be busy about the business that we've been called to do. Then, verse 8 happens. And Esau had an army of three Hundred thousand from Judah who carried shields and spears, and from Benjamin two hundred and eighty thousand men who carried shields and drew bows. All these were mighty men of valor. That, that means these were trained soldiers. It was from four hundred thousand now to five hundred and eighty thousand, just, just in, in, in the transition of power. As Esau for ten years, just, you know, training these young men, you know, pouring into them. There, there was a standing army of 580,000 mighty men of valor. The, the, these guys were, 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 were ready for war, even though there was no war. I, I think, you know, there, there, there's something to that. Showing a, a, a little bit of, of, you know, grit. Showing a little bit of, hey, you, you mess with us, we're, we're, we're not going to take it lying down. You're, 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 we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna fight back. Right? And, and he, he, he was preparing them. Then Zerah, the Ethiopians, came out against him with an army of a million men. There we go again. Not good odds. <laughs> right? You got 580 things. Okay, we're doing good. And then here comes an army and they go, yeah? You ain't seen nothing yet, buddy. We got a million guys. And, check this out, they had 300 chariots. And he came to Marisha. Now, a chariot in that day was like a tank. It wasn't just that you were almost doubled. You got, you got 300 tanks kind of on the front line ready to run at you, you know, to bury you over. 
And so here, here, here it is. 580,000, a million, and 300 tanks, just in case a million wasn't enough. <laughs> we're, 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 we're showing a little bit of force here, right? We're coming against you guys. And Asa went out against him, and they sent the troops, verse 10, in battle array in the valley of, of Zarephath in Marusha. And Asa cried out to the Lord his God and said, Lord, it's nothing for you to help, whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord, our God, for we rest on you, and in your name we go against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail against, I love this, you. <laughs> what, what, what a great declaration of faith yeah, guys I, I, th I think I think what what amazes me when, when, when you look at, at this passage is that Asa had no doubt in his mind that they were going to win this battle there was no doubt in Asa Lord they're fighting against you this is your battle you're you do not let man prevail against us because th th this is a spiritual war that's going on here. Man's extremities are God's opportunities. When we're at the end of ourselves is when we get to see God do his best work. That, that guys... Even with the previous king Abijah, God brought a victory because he cried out to him. Not even a loyal heart. And, 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 and God heard his prayer when he cried out to him. Now you've got Esau and he's got an army of 580 against a, a million and, and, a, and, and some tanks. And he's, he knows, you know what, if God, God can win that battle and that battle, he sure is going to win this battle. Lord, go before us. God, fight this battle on our behalf. And he knew that it was outside of his power to pull off this victory, but it wasn't outside of God's power to pull off this victory. As we find ourselves... Very much in the same predicament today. You, you, you realize what, what, what's really happening in our culture, in our world right now. The, 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 all of these, these legal battles, all of this abortion law, and, and they're, they're spinning it right now, and they're wanting this to be against the church. You, you realize that. They've already said last Sunday, and I heard going forward, they, they've, those that are for pro-choice have declared war against the church, and they're going to start picketing churches, and, and they, they've actually been, uh, you know, trespassing on churches. They, they, they've um, used the, this opportunity to, to make it against, against the, those who stand for life. This, this is spiritual. And, and our, only, our only defense is the Lord. I, I, I don't know how to fight this battle. I mean, I, I, I do, but I, I don't think the way I want to do it would be good. <laughs> like, Lord, give me, give, give, me, give, me, give me your heart because I, I don't result to my heart. My heart's wicked. I need your heart in this. And what, what, what's amazing is, is that the more you and I understand that there's a spiritual war going on and the odds are against us, the more that you and I become reliant upon the Lord to fight this battle for us. Because I, I know this, man, th th this battle is bigger than our culture right now has, has gone over the edge. And, and, and you and I are, are to be the, the, the conscience of our nation. So 
But we're living, we're in a, we're, we're in a society that doesn't want a conscience. And so they're going to fight against that conscience. They're going to they're, they're blame the conscience for the, for the shame or the guilt that they bring upon themselves. And so you, you and I become the target of their anger and their animosity. And you, it, it, it's spiritual. And unless the Lord intervenes, you, you and I don't stand a chance. But here's what I know, man. There's nothing too hard for God. These are the opportunities for God to bring revival. This is, this is the opportunity for God to pour out his spirit. This is the opportunity for God to change hearts. As all of these issues got to be brought to the forefront. And, and, and people got to sit down and weigh this out. Really, what, what, what is right and what is wrong? Who, whose eyes am I going to look at for right and wrong? You, you see... Is any time there's been a revival, it's because there's been some national tragedy. There's, there's been some predicament that, that everyone realizes, man, we're, we're, we're in trouble right now. It's, it's, it's happened throughout world history. That when it, when, it gets, when it gets like to the point where we have no other solution, then we finally fall on our knees and we say, God, help. The battle is outside of our control. And I think we're getting close. Guys, the, the drought that's going on is, is becoming severe. California right now is, is beginning to have stricter restrictions and, and there, there, there's becoming... Um, a, a serious concern because if, you, if you're not aware, much of what's grown to feed our nation is there. There's the, the food shortages are, are becoming, I think, a little more real. If you've been watching the news at all, baby food is, is scarce and it's expensive right now. And, and what is being talked about is if if you guys been looking for you know just groceries in general you you know that the cost of groceries is going up dramatically meat wheat and the rumor is that the the kind of prediction is kind of what they're saying is that in the next 2 to 3 months diesel price diesel diesel fuel is going to be scarce and that's what kind of the engine of our of our nation. That's our trucking. That's our farmers. That's it, it could be that God is saying, "Okay, it's 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 time to wake you up as a nation." And my only prayer is, is that is that we we would we would realize that God, in, unless you help, we're not going to make it. That, that we would be sensitive to, to the Holy Spirit convicting and, and, and the Holy Spirit working in our hearts that we, that we, would, we would be as a nation realize that, God, we, we, we've, we've turned our backs on you. We, we need to start tearing down some pillars. We, we, need, we need to start changing our course. We need to do what's right in your eyes. And you see, that, 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 that's the only time that we're going to see victory. It, it, it took an army of, of a million to... to bring them to that point it, it took the, the the king prior it, it took an an army against you know 400 to 800 thousand to, to bring it to that point and and then you you look around and and you realize that he, here 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 they are again you know in, in a predicament where unless god intervenes i i love this verse 13 Asa and the people who were with him pursued them to Gerar, so the Ethiopians were overthrown, and they could not recover, for they were broken before the Lord and his army, and they carried away very much spoil. Do they, they had come to take away spoil, but what happened is they ended up giving up all their spoil, the Ethiopians did. What the enemy was intending to, to bring great destruction, God used it to bring great provision. And what the enemy meant for evil, God turned around and used it for good. 
We, we had, we had a, a conference this last weekend. It was, it was, our, it was our servant leader conference. It, it's all on YouTube. If you want to join, I encourage you to go, go and it's some great teaching and just perspective and it's a great, great, great weekend. But one, one, one of, the, one of the, the pastors that came was from California, Pastor Ray Lou, and, and Pastor Ray started sharing. He said, man, even though COVID has been horrible, it's, you know, just, it, it, it wasn't something I would ever, thought we would ever have to go through. He said, let me tell you what's going on in California. He said, I, I, I can tell you this, it's better now after COVID than it was before COVID spiritually. The people in the church are awake more than they've ever been. See, California is kind of a, uh, th th there's, a there's kind of a sense that we're living in paradise when you're in California. Kind of like Hawaii, you know, you're in Hawaii, everyone thinks they're, everything's just, you know, they, what do I need the God for? What do I need the gospel for? Look, look, I got everything here. And I think in California, you kind of got that same mentality. Just, you know, you're, you're, you're chasing money. You're, you got the big house, you got the big car. Everyone's looking for greater success. And then something like this happens and it, and it, and it kind of shakes you to the point where you're like, wait a second, what's important? Well, wait a second, what, what are my priorities? I imagine when you're standing in line, especially if you're in the front of the line, and you're looking off at a million soldiers, and you realize behind me there's about 500,000, <laughs> you, you, you kind of evaluate your priorities. And evaluate, man, where, where am I gonna put my confidence right now? This, this, this is probably it. <laughs> Even if we win, I, I, I'm probably not gonna. I'm probably not gonna walk away from this battle. There's just moments like that where God has the opportunity to work. And I know for some of us, it's it's God's got to do that in a personal way. He has to break you. He has to he has to mold you. He has to shape you. He has to kind of he has to kind of bring you to your knees in order for you to finally say, "Okay, God, I tried it my way. I can't do this anymore." But to do it as a nation, and that 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 that's a whole other that's another level that's a whole other ball game. And and I, as we're looking at at these passages, you kind of realize, you know what, God's done this before. He's done this before, guys. This isn't something new for Him. He knows how to get the attention of His people. And I don't put it past them to do it again. May you and I be a light so that when whatever's going down, we, we, we're relatively, we're still at a time of peace, preparing. Preparing our own hearts, prepare, preparing our own lives, building our gates, you know, building our walls, whatever, you know, whatever you need to be doing to prepare because it's going to come down and it's going to happen at some point that we're going to be in a place where we're going to need God's help, God's intervention. Amazing, amazing story here, because the watch, look, look, look at the result of all of it. And let, let's wrap this, watch this. They defeated all the cities around Gerar, and the fear of the Lord came upon them. They plundered all the cities that were exceedingly much spoil in them. They also attacked the livestock enclosures, and they carried away sheep and camels in abundance, and they returned to Jerusalem. And the fear of the Lord went throughout the whole land. Because they realized, you know what? God's fighting their battle for them. God's the one who's bringing victory on their behalf. My question for us, who's fighting your battle? Who's fighting your battle? I pray with confidence you can say, man, it's the Lord. The Lord's fighting my battle. He, he's the one who I put my trust in, my confidence. He's the one that I cry out to in my time of need. He's the one who meets everything. I don't have to live in fear because I have a God who's big enough to handle anything that's going to come my way. And I know, I know without a shadow of a doubt, 
Like Asa stood up there and says, let me tell you something. This is nothing for God. He can handle it. Not only can he handle it, he's going to bring victory in it. Father, we are so thankful that you have a track record. <laughs> and we can look back over all, over all of the, the history of Israel and we can see that you, you are more than capable of, of winning battles that are unwinnable in man's eyes. God, you're able to bring win, win battles right here. God, in, in whatever it is we're facing, whatever it is, the, the, the struggles, the, the temptations, the, 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 the family situations, marriages, kids, God, whatever that battle looks like for us, God, you're able to bring victory. Father, may we trust you with all of our hearts. Lord, may we cry out to you in our time of need when we realize that, God, we, we, we can't win this battle unless you fight it for us. And Father, we thank you. Even, even with, with, with Abijah, who, who, who didn't have a loyal heart, all, all he had to do was cry out to you, and you heard him. Lord, I, I pray that be true. And Lord, we wouldn't be like Abijah. We would be like Esau. Lord, just, Lord, wanting what's right in your eyes. God, that we would desire God, to seek your face and to know your heart and to know your will. Would we line ourselves up with what you declare? Father, we pray your Holy Spirit, God, would convict us that, Lord, our conscience would be sensitive to the things you say, the things you declare. Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit, God, to move. And I pray tonight, Lord, maybe for some of us, we, we just need to just simply acknowledge, confess that, God, we, we, we're, we're in the wrong course. We are not doing what's right in your eyes. And today we want to repent of that. We want to turn from that. I pray, God, that, that you would... You would convict us tonight. I pray, God, for every one of those hearts that, that, it, that are in that position, in that place, God, that you would, Lord, just do a deep work in them. And we thank you, God, that you're faithful, that you hear our prayer, you know, God, you know what we need. We just lift up this night to you. We lift up this time to you. We ask it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Guys, we have a few announcements up on the screen if you would take a look at those announcements. Hello, church family. First up, the men's dinner will be on Thursday, May 26th, starting at 6.30 p.m. The cost for dinner is $5, and they will be meeting in the Grounded Coffee Shop. Gentlemen, come and join us for a great time of fellowship and a special teaching. Vacation Bible School will be on Monday, June 27th, and will go through Friday, July 1st. This year's theme will be the Founding Fathers. This is for ages kindergarten through the age of 12. You can now sign up and learn more at the table in the foyer. Extreme Team begins on Sunday, June 26th, and will go through Friday, July 1st. This is for ages 13 through 18, and they will be staying here at the church all through Vacation Bible School and will help minister to the children involved. Please sign up and learn more at the information desk. That's all the announcements for this week. If you would like any more information about any of these events, please stop by the information desk, hold on to your bulletin as a great reminder, or visit us online at ccrgv.com for all events and teachings. You can also download our church app in the Google Play and Apple Store. Thank you, everyone, and have a blessed week. Awesome, guys. Let's stand together. It's... Let's pray. Father, thank you. Love you. We ask that you, God, go before us. God, you, you know, Lord, on, on, a, on a national scale, God, the things that are in front of us. God, we, we know that it, it's not too big for you. Lord, we ask for your help, for your wisdom. God, we pray that the church would be the church. God, we would stand up and we would make a difference, that we'd be a light and a salt in the middle of, of a world that, that's decaying and a world that's dark. God, would you continue to 
God, give us your heart. Give us wisdom. Lord, I pray for our own families, our own children, God. That you bless them, watch over them, protect them, God. And give us God, the wisdom to navigate, Lord, in the days we're living in. May your love be on display. Lord, may Lord, we continue the great commission, making disciples. Lord, pouring out, God, your love into those around us. Lord, we ask that you, God, would bless our church family. Lord, bless uh, just those that are hurting, those that are going through the, the sicknesses and diseases and whatever else is, is in their path. Lord, would you, Lord, sustain them, hold them, go before them. Lord, our marriages, our homes. And Lord, we ask that you would bless our offerings we give to you as well, Lord. We lift you, all these things up to you. God, we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. May God bless you. May he keep you this week. Guys, we're starting the book of Philippians on Sunday morning. I'm excited. What a great book, epistle. And so uh, Philippians chapter 1, we'll take the first 11 verses. I encourage you to read ahead. Uh, man, what, what, what an amazing, amazing word of encouragement in, in difficult times. And man, great looking forward to what the Lord's going to be doing in our hearts through the book of Philippians. So uh, let's close in, in a song. May God bless you guys. May he keep you guys. You take what the enemy meant for evil. You turn it for good. Yes, you turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. Yes, you turn it for good. You turn it around. Yeah. You take the enemy bear for evil. And you turn it for good. Yes, you turn it for good. So I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm going to see a victory. Yes, I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to see a victory. Yes, I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take, you take the enemy bear for evil, and you turn it for good. Yes, you turn it for good. You take the enemy bear for evil, and you turn it for good. Yes, you turn it for good. You believe that? The Lord can go before us and he can use everything for his good. God bless you guys. Have a great rest of your week. Trust in the Lord.